In my opinion, history can happen any day. There are new plant species, new animal species, new archaeological and new geological discoveries daily, changing history as we know it. And in a way, without these changes, history can't evolve, and without the curiosity to explore our bountiful planet for all of the natural fossil treasures, we may never ever learn. One such treasure for me is ammonites. Hi, my name is Jason, I am a rock collector, I am an amateur archaeological enthusiast, and I am the CEO of Red Dragon Amolite Canada. We are very, very excited to be able to open up the Red Dragon Amolite mine and its vast supply of amolite to the industry. As well, I'm really excited to be able to offer to you a no-holds-bar access to ammonite like you've never seen before. We will create a series of videos detailing all things ammonite, ranging from production to ancient art design, uh, mystical arts, feng shui, and cultural references that we see here today. But you know what, enough about that. Let's start with the history of ammonite. Ammonites are a fantastic species ranging from 65 million all the way to 400 million years in the Silurian period. Uh, they had worldwide fossil distribution. They're found on all continents of the world and they swam in every single ocean on our planet. Um, they are a cephalopod. So a cephalopod, head-footed. Um, related to the squid, cuttlefish, uh, and octopus. Uh, they do have a living relative within the Nautilus uh, today, uh, but their closest relative that we feel would be uh, the squid, cuttlefish, or uh, octopus. We do feel that they were school-orientated, so again, imagine massive herring cylinders in the ocean. Uh, if you or I were to be swimming back in the ancient oceans back then, uh, we would be literally surrounded by millions of these creatures, they were that successful. Uh, in fact, uh, there are probably hundreds if not thousands of species of ammonites, uh, many different shapes and sizes. For example, we have here the baculites, uh, so picture if you will a large long baseball bat uh, cylinder, uh, again a fossil example here. Uh, you also have the scaphites, again the scaphites be be began turning and curling on both ends basically, really fascinating shapes. And then we also have the placenterids, uh, you can see with the plant spiral curl, uh, again that, that shell finally curled itself and became uh, what you see here. Um, there are a lot of theories that one evolved from the other, but actually that's not true. Each of them have their own separate ancestors and evolved from them. Really interesting that you can find actually all three species and types uh, of these guys in one massive uh, mining area or one massive die-off area. Uh, really interesting stuff. You know, people have theorized where and in, where in the ocean uh, they were. Uh, 650 feet perhaps all the way to the surface, which is the placenterids. Scaphites possibly in the middle. But again, chances are they went all over the ocean. Uh, as we'll get into some anatomy later, which is actually incredibly interesting. Uh, they were basically the dominant cephalopod in the ocean for 290 million years. So incredibly successful. Uh, and their lifespan is certainly up for um, speculation, as some say it's one to three years, others say it's four to thirty years or more. So again, we have not found any soft body parts of the animal, so really tough uh, to accurately say what these animals look like. And again, they had anywhere from, as you can see, we've depicted eight tentacles. They could have had four, ten, fifty, who knows? Uh, Again, it's all up for speculation at this point, so it's really up to you to find your own facts. Um, looking at what we do kind of know, definitely the females were the larger size. Uh, males were the smaller size, and the ratio from females to males is about 50 to 1. So, as good as that sounds, not too good as the males die right after spawning. Very typical of a salmon cycle. Uh, females gather the eggs, carry them. We'll get into that later. Uh, and then they die as soon as they uh, um, give birth to the eggs. Uh, we do feel that they may have had a beak like an octopus, a large brain, perhaps two gills, uh, and uh, extremely large eyes. Very intelligent, uh, we speculate. Uh, come on in. Come on in. Don't be shy. Come on in, guys. I want to talk a little bit about the anatomy. Uh, this is a placenterid, and you can see that it's been cut in half. So these guys are chambers. We'll get into that into a second. Here's where the animal would have been. So this would have been the body chamber here, the aperture where the head uh, stuck out. 
Uh, and then you can see each individual chambers. These are all actually filled with minerals, but you can actually see how intricate uh, and how intelligence, uh, intelligent this animal's design was. Uh, going into the phragma cone, leading all the way in through the chambers, about to the umbilicus. The umbilicus is the outside part of the center whorl, which is represented here in the prodisiconch. Uh, this is basically the embryotic equivalent of what they look like when they were born. So, interesting stuff. Uh, mum dies, flows to the bottom. Uh, babies literally eat their way out of mum, uh, go into a very predatorial ecosystem, either become part of it as food, of course, or uh, they grow and prosper. And again, what they would do is they would grow a new chamber, rotate, grow, 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 etc. Uh, and then um, keep going from there uh, in a way. Um, definitely looking forward at the sipuncle. The sipuncle was a tube that went through the middle of the animal or on the outside. And this allowed for rapid uh, onset of gas or uh, water and that for propulsion and for buoyancy. So really incredible animal and extremely well designed. Uh, looking here at the sutures, the sutures are very interesting because each placenterid uh, and most ammonites that have sutures all have each individual sutures. So you, the sutures will give away what species the uh, ammonite is. You can just see the intricate designs. Um, as well, sutures would also adhere the outer shell to the animal and also aid in uh, buoyancy and propulsion. You know, we talked a little bit about the anatomy. Now, let's talk about where and how they traveled the earth and why they were so successful. Part of the reason, besides their uh, great biology, is the fact that, you know, millions and millions of years ago, the Western Interior Seaway or the Cephalopod Seaway or the Bear Paw Seaway uh, was in motion. And you can see Alberta is here. And then you can see over a period of 1.4 and 1.7 million years how the topography changes. Of course, the area went through many different changes over millions and millions of years. Uh, the Rocky Mountains were forming, uh, tectonic plates were moving, etc., uh, which eventually formed the Bear Paw Formation. Uh, tens of millions of ammonites became landlocked, of course passed away, and then went through that process of fossilization, which we'll get at right after the Bear Paw Formation. Uh, the Bear Paw Formation is extremely unique, guys. It is uh, primarily in southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, Utah, and Montana. Uh, but Alberta is truly the only source of gemstone quality amylite in the world. Uh, that's what makes it extremely rare. Uh, most traditional mines, again, are about 80 feet deep to find a decent specimen. Uh, although recent events at uh, the Red Dragon Amylite Mine has proved a little bit different, really exciting stuff, we're going to get into that some other time. Back to amylite. Only about 1-10% to of all amylite found within the Bear Paw Formation would be suitable for jewelry. Uh, and 1-2% or 2 uh, would be the highest grade possible. Uh, so we definitely feel that it's rarer than diamonds, so there's no doubt about that. Um, talking and uh, moving on a little bit to fossils, so the fossilization process, so basically your, your, your cephalopod, your ammonite dies, it either floats to the bottom or it stays buoyant depending on gases and oxygen in the water, depending on many factors. First thing that happens is a whole bunch of critters goes in there and of course eats all the soft parts. The shell, empty shell, flow, basically sinks to the bottom where a whole bunch of rock, ash, and sediment form uh, inside the animal. And then again, tectonic plates, volcanoes, uh, a whole bunch of pressure over millions of years basically uh, allowed it to conform and make an ironstone concretion, which was part of the reason why industry experts feel that the Bear Paw Formation was so prolific in creating the jewelry is because the iron in the water mixed with the chemical composition in the soil within the Bear Paw Formation and of course created uh, the uh, amylite gemstone that we see. So come on in. You know, I just want to show you a few examples of amylite. I know you guys don't have a lot of time. We just wanted to show you a little bit of flash. This is indicative of the Bear Paw Formation, these guys here. And then coming over here, you can see the prodisiconch in here, and you can see the outer world leading into the chambers. And then over here, you can see some nice plates. And this is all from the uh, Bear Paw Formation. Well, you know, guys, I, I wanted to thank you for joining me today. Uh, it was such a privilege to talk about uh, ammonites and to be an ammonite hunter. Uh, I definitely want to invite you to go to reddragonammoliteCanada.com for more series videos and more information on the epic journey of how our ammonite gets turned into amylite. Thanks a lot.